Well, good morning, everyone. This is Jared Walzak, Vice President of State Projects at the Tax Foundation. Uh, thank you for joining our sixth and final State Tax Policy Bootcamp session. Uh, we're really happy to have you here. We know that <clears throat> this has been a commitment for a lot of people to join on six different Tuesday mornings. And for those of you who are watching at a later time, we really appreciate you doing so as well. I want to make sure that everyone knows that all of these sessions will remain available on our website at taxfoundation.org slash bootcamp. We'll continue to have them there. We hope that if they've been useful to you, you may return to them, and maybe you'll turn others towards them if you think they'll be useful to others down the road as well. In our final state tax policy bootcamp, we want to turn our attention to the present day to talk a little about the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on state revenues, on uh, state tax issues in general, on some of the interactions between state tax policy and the federal response and what some of the solutions states can adopt may be, especially as they are looking to grow their economies coming out of the pandemic, but also where necessary to respond to some revenue shortfalls. I'm joined today by my colleague, Catherine Lawhead. Uh, she is going to be taking much of this presentation, so both of us will be uh, you know, participating in this. We do have a Q&A session after this, as always. So uh, take a look for that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. At any point, you can ask questions. We'll take them at the end, but feel free to ask them at any time. And with that, I think we'll jump right in and start talking about um, just some of the general policy issues um, you know, re regarding state revenue and some of these responses. <clears throat> now, what's really interesting, I think people have recognized this by now, but certainly this was not the anticipation a month ago, is that state and local combined revenues are actually up in 2020. Now, they're certainly not up by the amount that states would have forecast prior to the pandemic. They anticipated significant growth, as we had seen in previous years. And in fact, states saw a small but meaningful decline, about 1% revenue loss, uh, about $11 billion total across all states in 2020, while local governments were up about $29 billion. Uh, that's about a 4% increase. Uh, these numbers might change a little. Uh, we're operating on the latest BEA and census data and uh, some of that's provisional. Uh, there are a few gaps in it, so these are best available numbers right now. Uh, they won't change much, but they could change by fractions of percents. <clears throat> So again, we're looking at this situation where state and local combined revenue is up by 1%, about 18 billion across those. And that's notable, of course, because the American Rescue Plan Act has over, it has $350 billion in fiscal relief for state and local governments, which doesn't really match a scenario where there's 18 billion in revenue gains. But of course, that does paper over some discrepancies and some differences across states. We have seen some states with significant revenue losses. That has largely been around two areas. One, states that rely heavily on the energy sector. If you get a lot of your tax revenue from severance taxes or from other taxes on the oil and natural gas industries, this has been a rough year. It was honestly going to be a rough year even prior to the pandemic. Uh, we had seen energy prices plummet and then the reduction in utilization uh, during the pandemic certainly did not help matters. Uh, the other area affected very clearly by the pandemic is states that rely heavily on tourism. Now, very obviously, tourism ground to a halt during the pandemic, and a lot of states that normally rely heavily on that uh, are struggling right now. They just don't have that sort of uh, impact in their economy at the moment. Uh, what's notable is that it doesn't necessarily line up very well with the allocation of aid under the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, because that is based on employment losses. And that's something we had actually supported. We had talked about a couple of different ways that you could allocate this. And back last May, we suggested that you know, um, using employment losses was one legitimate way of targeting. And that is, it's a legitimate way of targeting. What has happened since though, suggests that it may not be the best current way to uh, allocate because you have this, this situation where employment losses do not really scale with revenue losses for state. They're a huge issue. Uh, they are probably the most important issue, which is why the federal government is responding so aggressively uh, directly on that point with unemployment compensation assistance, all of these different things. Uh, but in terms of where the revenue losses are, that has really not been significant. It has been um, where you either have that reliance on energy or on tourism. So, you know, why is that? Why has there been revenue stability? One, the stock market did well. And the stock market is not the economy, um, but the stock market does drive a lot of state tax revenues, especially income tax revenues. You go back to the Great Recession, capital gains realization slid 71% in one year. Over this past year, we've seen the stock markets rise. Uh, we've seen capital gains increase. So that huge source of revenue that usually disappears, goes negative during an economic downturn, stayed positive. 
you had the Paycheck Protection Program loans, which saved both jobs, uh, which meant continued payroll, which meant continued income tax collections, and businesses, which meant that the business taxes continued to be paid. The enhanced and expanded unemployment compensation benefits are taxable in some states. Now, uh, maybe less so, the federal government just adopted a $10,200 exclusion, and a lot of states are going to follow that, so that's going to carve out some of that revenue. Uh, but it's available to states. And then there's a lot of other aid to individuals and businesses, including those checks directly to taxpayers that, um, whether they're taxable or not, the checks, for instance, are not, they are uh, infusing additional money into the economy. And at least in the short term, that has meant that you know, spending has been up. Um, a lot of the different indicators we usually care about for tax revenue are doing quite well. Uh, so we have this aid going out to uh, state and local governments. There's going to be real questions. And we'll be talking about this in things we write. We'll have other resources addressing this. You know, states are going to have trouble in some cases spending some of this because it can only go into four buckets. Uh, one of them is very similar to the CARES Act. It's the you know, direct responses to the pandemic, you know, the economic assistance, the public health responses. Many states struggle to spend that with the $150 billion they got in the CARES Act. Uh, they just didn't have enough expenditures there. Then there's the very limited infrastructure piece of this, the uh, the provision with regard to, um, you know, um, water, sewer, and broadband. So I think we'll see a lot of rural broadband projects and some, you know, water projects that have been long delayed, but you can't put it towards all infrastructure. You can't put it towards your roads and bridges and transit and all of that. Um, you know, you, you have the provision about enhanced payment for essential workers, and states haven't done that in the past, but maybe we'll see a few uh, try that now. And... Uh, yeah, after that, um, you can backfill an actual revenue loss. So some states have that. Many states do not. That's not available to a lot of states. And those are your four buckets. So there's a lot of things that states might have expenditures they'd be looking to use this on. They just can't. And therefore, many states have billions of dollars in available relief that may be relatively difficult to spend. So some have said, well, what about tax cuts? And let's talk a little about the tax cut provision um, because there, there is this limitation on uh, state tax cuts. And I'm not running the slide deck today. If someone else could um, move, move the slide deck one forward, I would appreciate it and thank you. Um, yeah, but there, there's this limitation in um, the, the tax cuts um, that you can enact during uh, the coming three years uh, under the American Rescue Plan Act. And it's not a prohibition on tax cuts, but there's been a lot of confusion you can see the statutory language on the right here on the slide in front of you. The provision is vague, uh, but it potentially implicates a wide range of tax decisions, not just the rate reductions, but uh, conformity uh, to the Internal Revenue Code, excluding unemployment compensation from taxation, adjusting deductions, lots of things that states do uh, that are relatively routine in many cases could theoretically be implicated by this exclusion. Now, the direct point of this is pretty clear. It's to prevent a state from taking this large grant of money from the federal government and turning around and putting it towards a temporary tax cut. And that's a, probably a pretty good restriction. That's not really what the money's for. It's perfectly reasonable for the federal government to say you cannot do that. So the direct prohibition here is pretty straightforward, clearly a matter of true federal authority. Uh, there's also a provision, though, um, that doesn't allow you to indirectly offset a reduction in the net tax revenue of a state, uh, resulting from a change in tax uh, in rates or regulations, all of these different things. And that's where this gets really complex, because states have asked, well, what if we could have done a tax cut on our own? And we don't need this money, but we are using it. It's available to us. We're going to use it for its intended purposes, uh, but we're also going to enact a tax cut. Are we prohibited from doing that for the next few years? And if the answer to that is yes, we actually have a serious constitutional problem. Uh, there are a number of cases you can see listed here, the Pennhurst case, South Dakota v. Dole, uh, and IV v. Sebelius, um, where there are restrictions imposed by the court on how states' hands can be tied, essentially, on policy uh, based on the receipt of federal funding. You can definitely condition federal funding in terms of how you spend that funding itself. Um, if you don't want to spend it the way that the grant is written, you don't get the money. Um, when it's certain extraneous things, you know, states must adopt this policy if they want to receive the money. Uh, it's not an absolute prohibition on the federal authority there, but it's definitely limited. In South Dakota v. Dole, um, the federal government wanted changes in uh, drinking laws. They wanted a, high, a higher drinking age. They wanted changes in uh, you know, drunk driving laws. And to do this, they conditioned 5% of federal highway funding. They said that you'd lose 5% of your federal highway funding if you didn't make these changes in law. And the Supreme Court actually upheld that. 
but they upheld it in part because they felt that um, it was very clear um, what was required of states. It was very binary. You did this or you didn't. And also that it was only a small portion of the available funding. It wouldn't break the bank, essentially. They said that you cannot be unduly coercive if functionally a state had no choice but to adopt these policies, that would be a significant problem. So they felt 5% was okay. This is the problem with constitutional doctrines that are you know, a little you know, vague in these regards. Okay, 5% is okay, what about 10%? We don't know exactly where that line is. We know something that's on the other side of the line though, and that's the NFIB v. Sebelius case. And this is one of the many um, yeah, cases about the Affordable Care Act. And this one is a plurality opinion. There's lots of different pieces of it where the court parsed different things, but there's one provision where you had most of the justices, uh, you know, both uh, conservative and liberal justices agreeing, and that's that you could not condition the receipt of Medicaid dollars from the federal government on a state's decision on whether or not to expand Medicaid, that you couldn't just take that away from them because that was too coercive. And if this is read really broadly, if the idea is that a state's fiscal authority is basically taken away from it for uh, three years, uh, if they accept any of this federal money, even if it's not really the reason they're cutting taxes, that is almost certainly unduly coercive. And the language is vague enough that it could allow that. But it's also vague enough that Treasury could come up with an interpretation, uh, a viable interpretation, that is much narrower, that defines these things in different ways. So I've written a paper, you can find it in the resources for today's session, uh, four questions for Treasury, uh, that if they answer, um, depending on how they answer, could not only provide important clarity for states, but also can save the statute, they can, can make it constitutional, um, can address a lot of these problems. The first is what constitutes a net tax reduction? Uh, that might seem like a strange question, but it's actually a really tough thing to answer. What's the baseline? Is it what's called a current policy baseline, where Anything that reduces tax revenue compared to what they would have been if you didn't enact the policy is a reduction, is a net reduction, and therefore it's out unless you fully offset it also in current policy. Or is it a revenue baseline where let's say you had you know, expectations of revenue growth and you put a portion of that towards a tax cut, but your revenue will still be higher than it was the previous year. Is that a net tax cut? Uh, there's a lot of different ways you could define this and depending on how Treasury defines it, it becomes more or less reasonable. States have balanced budget requirements. So if a net tax cut is defined narrowly, it has almost no impact on states other than preventing them from using the money directly to aid this. Um, you know, how's a reduction determined to result from a policy change? Uh, so <clears throat> lots of different ways that you can change policy. What if you have rolling conformity to the Internal Revenue Code and therefore the, the federal government does something like, for instance, excluding $10,200 worth of unemployment compensation? Uh, did you just adopt a net tax cut or was that something that was already in place and therefore outside of this covered period? Uh, what if you needed to make an administrative determination of whether it was viable? Let's say you had tax triggers. You're reducing taxes based on revenues. You had adopted this prior to the uh, period that's covered by this, but you know, the Department of Revenue needs to decide whether uh, the next trigger goes into effect based on a revenue determination. Is that covered or is it not? Um, which expenditures create fiscal capacity for a net tax cut? Because remember, the idea is that it's prohibited if it's indirectly offsetting a tax cut. So you can imagine shell games, right? You know, okay, we can't put the money directly into a tax cut, but we will instead, you know, cover all of our current operating costs with this money and then, uh, you know, do a tax cut with what's left over with our money. The real problem with that before we even get into the indirect pro prohibition is that you can't spend the money that way. There's only four things you can spend the money on and you can't just offset your general spending. So which expenditures theoretically could contribute to a net tax cut? Um, it might be narrow. It might be uh, covering actual revenue losses. Um, and maybe if you can pay like public health and public safety official salaries out of this. The rest of it probably can't. And hopefully we'll get some clarification on that. But most of the rest of it is outside of your general operating budget. It's really hard to see how that could contribute to a net tax cut since it's you know, sort of external spending. And then, you know, then, then how, would an offsetting, how would offsetting a tax reduction be defined? You know, imagine you did have some revenue losses in the first year. You use this money to cover it. But then in the second year, in the third year, you have some tax cuts that are fully offset by revenue growth. Or you have tax cuts that are offset by spending reductions or something else. Um, you know, is that going to be implicated or not? The early indications we have from Treasury are that they probably intend to interpret this narrowly. 
Uh, Senator Joe Manchin, uh, who was the one who championed this amendment, certainly based on his recent floor remarks, seems to think that it is intended to be narrow. Uh, now, obviously, uh, legislative intent, especially when stated after the enactment of the provision, is not binding, but I think we have a lot of indications that uh, the intentions here are pretty narrow and hopefully treasury guidance will be forthcoming quickly and also be narrow. This isn't just a question of whether we should or shouldn't have tax cuts or whether this is the right time for tax cuts. It's very much a question of state fiscal authority. Um, we probably, regardless of where you are on the political spectrum, do not want to be in a situation where the federal government can substantially control uh, state policy decisions using um, generally available revenue. Uh, that's a place that just yeah, really bind states' hands in perhaps an inappropriate manner. I don't think it was the intention of the drafters of this amendment or those who adopted the American Rescue Plan Act. So uh, there could be a legislative fix to that. There's obviously a number of senators who want to repeal this provision. Uh, it also could be struck down by the courts, especially if there's a broad interpretation, or you might see the saving interpretation by Treasury, but we need an answer sooner rather than later, because right now states really don't know what they can do. And again, this isn't just net tax cuts. You wanna expand your in earned income tax credit, you want to exclude unemployment compensation, you want to do your annual increase of a standard deduction for next year. I mean, all of these things right now are uh, in limbo, and that's not a great place to be. I think we'll get answers to that. Uh, now, it's possible that even if there's narrow Treasury guidance that the courts could still strike this down. Um, there is a, an argument, I think a fairly good argument, that um, the requirement in Pennhurst, which is um, echoed in South Dakota v. Dole, um, which states that um, you are not allowed to... Um, Sorry, some uh, some the outside noise here. Apologize for that, um, but yeah, I think there is the possibility that even um, even in a situation where you have a narrow interpretation, you run into a problem where um, you know just that ambiguity of what states can and cannot do um, means the the statute is unconstitutional. We will see, but hopefully, again, I think we have a pretty good idea of where this is heading, and also hopefully we'll have guidance that clarifies that. I think it's a really important thing um, for us all to understand where we are right now. And with that, and with apologies for that little tech glitch, some outside noise outside my window, um, you know, we, well, I'll turn this over to uh, Catherine if she wants to then discuss a lot of the other responses that uh, states have as they're thinking about the economic recovery. Thanks, Darren. So today I'll be discussing tax policy options for states that are looking to aid their economic recovery. So when it comes to the economic recovery responses, the federal government has responded very aggressively with the Families First Coronavirus Response Act and then the CARES Act in March of 2020, and then the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act in December, and now the American Rescue Plan Act just a couple weeks ago. So in most cases, states that are looking to aid their own economic recovery can start by simply responding to what the federal government has already done, both in terms of conforming to provisions that it makes sense to conform to and using the federal aid money wisely. But beyond that, states should also be thinking about ways they can make their underlying tax codes more competitive and more conducive to recovery and growth. So I'll walk through each of the five items on the screen, but one caveat here is that there's still, of course, a lot of uncertainty about the ARPA provision that Jared just mentioned. So this could have an impact on states' decisions with regards to cutting taxes, but for purposes of this discussion, I'll go ahead and just assume that states can make tax reductions without running afoul of ARPA. So as Jared mentioned, it is not notable that a lot of states did experience revenue growth last year. Not every state did, of course, but the extremely generous federal aid package that was just enacted will more than cover state revenue gaps. So for states that find themselves in a good position economically, now is a good time to think about structural reforms that can aid the recovery and better position states for a, mo a more mobile and flexible post-pandemic economy. So our first recommendation is for states to conform to federal pandemic related tax relief provisions where possible, especially the ones that were specifically designed to enhance business liquidity. 
So of all the changes states, states can make right now to aid their recovery, conformity decisions are probably the easiest because states have to routinely update their conformity statutes anyway. And to provide a bit of background on how conformity works, Nearly all states use the federal tax code as the starting point for their own income taxes. And so they bring in federal statutes and definitions, case law, treasury department guidance by reference. But not all states conform automatically. A number of states conform on a static basis. So they conform to the IRC as it existed at a specific point in time. And over the past few years, and especially over the course of the past year, we're seeing just how quickly the federal government has and can make tax changes. And that can lead to a lot of complexity for states, especially states that use static conformity and can quickly go out of date if they're conforming to even a, a version of the IRC that's just a year old. So divergence on matters of conformity does have a lot of impacts. In addition to the complexity, it can sometimes result in increased tax liability for individuals and businesses at the state level. And it can also just uh, create weird distortions where there's convoluted uh, things going on that weren't necessarily intended. So overall, it's a good idea for states to move more toward rolling conformity to provide more certainty to taxpayers. Now, this does come at a little bit of a cost of some state control, but states can always enact legislation if there are certain provisions that they do think need to be decoupled from. But in general, ro rolling conformity provides a good amount of clarity to taxpayers. And Iowa is actually an example of a state that previously used static conformity, but recently moved to rolling starting in tax year 2020. So states can make these changes. Now, uh, when it comes to states conformity to more recent um, federal aid in response to the pandemic, there's a lot of different provisions they could conform to. But for today's discussion, I want to focus on some of the most valuable ones uh, that were specifically de designed to enhance business liquidity. So the map on the screen shows how states currently conform to the federal tax treatment of Paycheck Protection Program loans. So at the federal level, Congress determined that these loans would not be taxed as income. And then they later determined that business expenses paid for using those loans would remain deductible. Now, this was a bit confusing how this actually happened because the exclusion from income was made in March of 2020 with the CARES Act. Um, but the Treasury Department, after that was enacted, later came back and said, oh, by the way, you know, based on how you conform uh, or based on uh, existing federal law, there are other provisions that generally prevent firms from being able to deduct exp expenses associated with income that was tax free. So a lot of states are in a kind of weird position if they conform to a post CARES Act, but pre-consolidated Appropriations Act version of the IRC because they will bring in that treasury guidance that says their loans are excluded from income, but the expense deduction is denied. Now, states that are really out of date will um, and are conformed to a post or to a pre-CARES Act version of the IRC will generally treat forgiven federal loans as income, which is normally how most forgiven loans are treated, but they will allow the expense deduction since most business expenses are, new, are normally deductible. So there's a lot of states that are taxing these loans in one way or the other. A number of states have acted to fix this and to conform to the federal provision in recent weeks, um, but as soon as possible, states should provide some clarity to taxpayers on how those will be treated. And then a couple other provisions worth mentioning are the treatment of net operating losses under Section 172 and the treatment of business interest expenses under Section 163J. Now, I don't have time to go into all of this now. We'll be publishing more on this soon. But um, under the CARES Act, NOLs can be carried back up to five years for each of tax years 2018, 2019, and 2020. The CARES Act also suspended the limit that was put in place by the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that generally limits L NOL carry forwards to offsetting no more than 80% of taxable income in any given year. So that was also suspended for tax years 2018 through 2020. And then the CARES Act for tax years 2018 through 
or 2018 and 2019 also increased the amount of business ex interest expenses that are deductible from 50 from 30 percent of modified income which was put in place under the tax cuts and jobs act to now 50 percent of modified income for those two years alone now, a lot of states don't fully conform to either Section 172 or 163J. For instance, a number of states specifically decoupled from 163J after that provision was put in place by the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, since it was a base broadening provision. A lot of states decided to have a state, de state defined exclusion for interest expenses of 100%. However, if states do conform to either of these provisions, it does make a lot of sense to conform to the CARES Act relief and provide those NOL carrybacks and allow more business interest to be deductible. Uh, this will provide a lot of relief to businesses, allowing them to uh, file an amended return for past tax years if they have losses or if they are making interest payments on loans that they've had to take out in the pandemic or in recent years. And this will just really enhance liquidity at the federal level and at the state level for uh, states that conform. And then finally on the unemployment compensation provision. So as Jared mentioned, the ARPA law excludes from taxation the first $10,200 of unemployment compensation benefits received in 2020 for those with modified adjusted gross income below $150,000. And now that's regardless of filing status. So there is a bit of a tax cliff there. But a lot of states are in an interesting, are in an interesting position position because most states generally conform to section 85 of the IRC, which generally treats all unemployment compensation as taxable. But states that use static conformity to that provision will not bring in the exclusion, while states that use rolling conformity now do bring in that exclusion. So states will have to act quickly if they want to provide the same relief at the state level. Maine is a state that has already done this. Um, Either way, it's important that uh, states act as quickly as they can to provide clarity on this provision as soon as possible, especially as we are in the middle of tax season. Um, and then next, I would like to talk about how states should modernize tax rules to better accommodate telework and the new economy. And this is something I wanna go through a little more quickly because Jared has talked about it at length in a previous session. But the pandemic has definitely accelerated the trend toward widespread remote work flexibility. And this was certainly already a trend that was emerging, but it has definitely been accelerated by the pandemic. But a lot of states are not friendly to telework and a lot of states are not even friendly to traveling for work at all. Uh, the map on the screen shows the states in maroon are some of the least friendly toward traveling for work or teleworking, working in another state for even just one day. And a lot of those states can trigger not only withholding requirements where the employer has to withhold taxes on, in those states on behalf of the employee, but also filing requirements for individuals so that those individuals have to file returns in those states even if they traveled there for just a day, and even if they definitely don't make enough income to um, owe taxes there for just one day working in that state. But these laws are in place in a lot of ways just to try to capture the income of highly compensated individuals, whether CEOs that are traveling or athletes that might play in a state for a day. But the reality is these impact everyone who travels and who um, has mobility like that when they work. And so it creates a lot of um, reason for a lot of employers to try to limit um, remote, remote work flexibility and it's just not conducive to the new economy. So it'd be a good idea for states to on their own increase a de minimis exemption. So maybe allow 30 days or some amount of minimum time that someone will have to be in a state in order to trigger these filing requirements and withholding requirements. Um, the federal government does also have authority to be able to set some sort of baseline standard like that. So that's certainly an option. And on a related note, as Jared has also talked about in a past session, income tax nexus laws are also outdated. Uh, nexus laws that impact multi-state businesses um, 
The main federal law governing those is PL 86272. It was put in place 65 years ago with the intent that it be a very temporary fix, but now 65 years later, it is still in place and Congress hasn't acted to modernize it yet. But generally that extends some protections against triggering nexus if all a business does in a particular state is solicit the sales solicit the sale of tangible property. But those same business, those same pr protections don't apply if a business is soliciting the sale of services in a state. Now, um, generally states do have income tax nexus if they have other property or, or employees or other sufficient economic nexus there. But if all they're doing is soliciting the sale of services in a state, they should really get these same protections that are available to the sale of tangible property. So the Business Activity Tax Simplification Act is one proposal that has been offered at the federal level as a solution to modernize this provision. And it would make sense to look at this type of modernization, especially at a time like this. The next recommendation we have is for states to avoid taxing international income. Now, this is not something that wasn't really an issue at all until after the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was enacted. And it's kind of ironic because the 2017 federal tax reform law was largely a retreat from the taxation of international income at the federal level. Now, that law did put in place two major guardrails, the global intangible low tax income tax or guilty and the base erosion anti-abuse tax or BEAT. But overall, the federal government was moving more to away from worldwide taxation, more toward a quasi-territorial system. However, due to the way states conform to this provision, a lot of states are on track to bring in this income, this international income at the state level. This is something states should really avoid. For one reason, a lot of states already have decoupled from it and said they won't tax international income. So that means states that do are at a competitive disadvantage in terms of attracting multinational businesses into their state. Um, another thing is states just don't have the same credit for foreign taxes paid that the federal government does. So states can end up taxing a much larger share of international income than even the federal government does. And then apportioning guilty is very complicated and difficult and different schemes can result in multiple ta taxation of guilty at the state level. So at a time like this, it's especially important for states to create a, an environment that is hospitable for multinational businesses. And so moving away from tax and guilty is a, a good approach at a time like this. Another way states can help improve their economic recovery is by generally avoiding taxes that fall on businesses even when they're not profitable. So some examples of this are uh, capital stock taxes, tangible personal property taxes, and gross receipts taxes. Um, these are all types of taxes that businesses pay even if they don't make a profit in any given year. So we're seeing just how burdensome they are, especially at a time like this, when a lot of states are in the red through no fault of their own, and it could take them years to return to profitability. So generally capital stock taxes are taxes that fall on businesses net worth or the value of accumulated assets in a state. They're sometimes known as franchise taxes. They're usually levied on the privilege of doing business in a state, um, but in a lot of ways they are duplicative and they create a lot of burdens for, state, for businesses in states that levy them. The trend right now is to move away from capital stock taxes. Uh, a lot of states are in the process of phasing them out. New York's phased out at the end of last year and Illinois, Mississippi and Connecticut are all in the process of phasing theirs out. And so that's a good, rec that's a good policy change for other states to consider as well. And then tangible personal property taxes. These are structured a lot like uh, real property taxes in terms of their rates that apply and in the fact that they're levied on the value of property in any given year, but they are much more economically harmful than taxes on real property because they apply specifically to business 
capital. So things like machinery and equipment, business inventory and estate, anything that can be touched and move, moved could be subject to a state's TPP taxes, depending on the state and specific, specifically what is included in its TPP tax base. But in general, they can create a lot of tax distortions. Uh, they discourage in-state investment. They're taxpayer active. So businesses have to calculate the depreciable value of this property in any given year and then remit the appropriate amount. These are outdated and, and there's really no place for them in a 21st century economy. So moving away from these taxes is a good idea for states. And then finally, gross receipts taxes. These taxes are uh, some of the most harmful taxes that states can levy. And uh, this is because they do not account for things like business expenses or so cost of goods sold, cost of wages paid to employees. None of that is taken into account. Gross receipts taxes just apply to a business's tax a gross taxable gross revenue in a given year. And so they're especially harmful for businesses that are either not profitable or that have high prof or that uh, have uh, lower profit margins, um, high production volumes, since uh, they don't account for any of those expenses. Now, um, these are all things that are really harmful, especially during this pandemic. Um, they think states should look to move away from anyway, but now would be an especially good time to work toward phasing those out. Our final recommendation is to look at reforming unemployment insurance tax system to systems to prevent untimely tax hikes. Now, this is something that um, it has really come to the forefront just because of how UI tax systems are designed. They're designed in such a way that when UI, when unemployment compensation trust fund drawdown is high, when a lot of people are filing for unemployment, tax increases are triggered automatically. And this is especially harmful to those businesses that are being forced to lay off employees through no fault of their own. Um, they can be subject to much higher tax rates all of a sudden. So a lot of the layoffs that occurred in 2020, businesses are starting to face higher tax rates in this, this year and for the next few years because of those layoffs. But a lot of states have acted to try to avoid that. Avoid that. So there are kind of two major ways that these automatic tax hikes could be triggered. One is just in the, um, the unemployment income tax rate schedules that are in effect at any given time. When trust fund drawdown is high, states automatically move from lower minimum and maximum rate schedules to higher tax rate schedules. So those would impact all employers. And then there's also the experience ratings impacts. So in general, each, each state um, and each business, each business has certain experience ratings that are used to determine specifically what UI tax rate that business will pay. And it's based on that, that business's history of layoffs over the past few years. And so businesses that are, were perhaps deemed non-essential during the pandemic or um, had especially high layoffs will face even higher tax rates than more essential businesses that were able to retain most of their employees. But thankfully, a lot of states have acted to try to prevent these untimely tax increases right now. The map on the screen shows states that um, as of last May had already acted to try to freeze experience ratings so that employers would not be penalized for pandemic related layoffs. Um, so that is something to consider, especially um, given the fact that the ARPA money will be able to be used to help pay out current unemployment claims. So this should be able to help prevent further depletion of UC funds. Um, so states will of course eventually have to replenish these funds, but doing so now by raising taxes right now when we're still in the midst of this crisis and there are still a lot of businesses that are, have had to lay off their workers and a lot of people who are still unemployed. Now is not the time to do that. Doing so could face, could um, put more businesses out of business. And even those that do survive, uh, raising UI taxes now would slow down the process and make it uh, 
take a little more time before they're able to rehire their employees. So now that I've talked about some tax reductions uh, states could consider to try to aid their economic recovery, I will briefly mention some revenue options for states that are looking at raising additional revenue. Now, as Jared mentioned, it doesn't really make sense for states to be looking at raising taxes right now. Um, a lot of states, of course, did have revenues come in better than projected and better than their 2019 revenues. So in states where revenue is up, um, those states really should avoid looking at tax increases. And then for those states um, that maybe did have revenue shortfalls, that federal aid from ARPA is covering that. And so states should be in a good position financially um, as a result of this aid. But if states are still set on looking at raising taxes, there are more and less economically harmful ways to do so. So a couple of the less economically harmful ways are number one, to modernize the sales tax base to additional consumer goods and services. Um, this is something states should be looking at anyway, because sales taxes are so outdated. When they were first enacted, they mostly captured uh, tangible property, but not services. So when you think about a lot of the services people are buying right now, um, things like streaming services um, or things like um, grocery delivery or restaurant food delivery, things like that. In a lot of states, those things aren't yet subject to sales taxes. Now we're not saying those things should be subject to excise taxes. And that's something a lot of states unfortunately have started looking at. Um, and there's a very good reason for that. Um, these types of new economy things aren't creating negative externalities that need to be offset through tax increases. But these things should, they are consumption and they should be included in the consumption tax base. Now it is important as the sales tax base is modernized to avoid newly applying these sales taxes to business to business purchases uh, because that leads to tax pyramiding where ultimately those taxes get passed along to consumers but in a non-transparent way in the forms of higher prices. In addition to sales tax based modernization, another potential revenue raiser that would be less economically harmful than others is to look at streamlining business economic development incentives. The reason for this is that a lot of these incentives merely subsidize activities and investments that are occurring anyway, but they do so in a non-neutral non way, picking certain win winners and losers. Um, these just aren't the most um, appropriate way to structure a tax code. A much better tax code, an ideally structured tax code, would encourage investment by treating all businesses neutrally and by looking at ways to reduce economically harmful taxes on employers, no matter if they, no matter what industry they're in, no matter if they've existed in the state for a long time or if they're new to the state. Um, but streamlining some of these incentives and walking back the ones that maybe aren't doing what they're, what they were set out to do would be one less economically harmful way to raise additional revenue. So I will go ahead and pass things back over to Jared to wrap up our session. Well, thank you, Catherine. And thanks to everyone who's joined. We have a number of great questions we're going to get to in just a moment. Um, for those of you though, who have joined this and maybe some of our latter sessions, but didn't start with us, I do want to remind you that all six sessions will be available online at taxfoundation.org slash bootcamp. And that includes our first two sessions, which were more of a tax 101 going through a lot of the structural provisions within the major taxes, individual and corporate income taxes, the sales tax, excise taxes, property taxes, UI taxes, a lot of information there that hopefully will be helpful for all of you. Uh, some of our latter sessions have been more policy oriented, state taxation and remote work, um, excise taxes on new markets, new issues in state taxation, and then of course today's session. But want to remind you that those first two sessions in particular, that tax policy 101 is there. Um, hopefully that has some uh, continuing you know, um, yeah, applicability as all of you work on tax policy issues. With that, I do want to take a few of the questions that we've received. We have a number of good ones today. Um, one question is, can you replenish your unemployment compensation trust funds with the money you receive from the American Rescue Plan Act to avert future UI tax hikes during this or future recession? It's a really good question to which we do not know an answer. 
I mentioned before that there are four buckets the, of spending you can do. None of them explicitly uh, authorize you to put money towards the unemployment compensation trust funds, but one of them which provides for uh, general economic responses um, and you know, economic responses to the negative effects of the pandemic. It's language very similar to the Coronavirus Relief Fund and the CARES Act, and at least one state, maybe more, have in fact used that to backfill their UC trust funds. And we haven't heard otherwise thus far. So you could make the argument that if they got away with it before, maybe that's allowed now. The one new provision, of course, is that you cannot uh, use this money to offset a net tax in tax reduction, including uh, by off by preventing a tax increase from going into effect. So we do know, of course, that you know, you have a lot of automatic tax increases that happen if your trust fund is insolvent or reaches certain levels. So you are staving off a tax increase by depositing money into that fund, even though that's not the only or the primary reason to do so. You need it to pay out claims. But this raises important questions. I do not know the answer to that. I'm hoping the Treasury guidance will address that uh, because it's just it's a complex question given the current language. I hope you can use it because honestly, this is the greatest area of need. I think I've mentioned previously that you know, last year, $144 billion was spent by states on regular unemployment compensation. Usually it's about $30 billion. When we talk about the fact that states have only lost $11 billion in revenue, the really big hit to them is that they spent like $115 billion more on unemployment compensation than they usually do. They depleted those funds. Many states have in fact taken out uh, Title 12 advances, federal loans that will have to be repaid. So hopefully, this will be a, an authorized expenditure. We argued it should actually be the primary way that the federal government provided relief to states. Obviously, that's not what happened. Um, what we do know, or you know, have very strong reason to believe, because a lot of states have already been doing this, and it, there was guidance expressly on the CARES Act allowing this, is you can pay your current unemployment compensation benefit claims out of this money, as Catherine mentioned, and I think that probably every state should be doing that. There's going to be struggles to use this money. You know that's a need. You know it's available. Um, it makes sense to use it for that purpose. So hopefully that is at least something that will be directly addressed. Another question we had is, it seems like conformity is good so long as federal law is good policy, um, but you know, what if it's bad policy? Is, um, you know, what, how do you address rolling conformity? Is it good um, on its own or does it matter what the policies are? And of course, not all federal tax policy is good policy. Um, there's a case for rolling conformity anyway. Uh, when you have static conformity, things get really difficult. You have to essentially work backwards. And this is especially true for business taxpayers that have much more complex tax situations where you are using the equivalent of say the 2015 federal tax code for some of your calculations for one state and the current tax code for everything else. And that means not only the, you have to go back on what the provisions were in 2015, but say, federal guidance and federal uh, letter rulings and everything else that have been issued since, you need to make a determination of whether they are applicable equally to the code as existed in 2015, or if they're only applicable because of changes made since then. It's incredibly complex. It's not a great way to do tax policy. Uh, every state decouples from certain provisions in the Internal Revenue Code. So you can always expressly decouple from a provision you don't like, and sometimes that can be perfectly appropriate, but it's better to be explicit. It's better to say, we follow the federal government except on this list of things than it is to have this vagueness and confusion about being years behind on your IRC conformity. Um, another question on if a state has low income tax rates, would that attract workers even with first day withholding? I think these are in some ways two different things. Um, the argument about attracting individuals, attracting workers is largely one about you know, creating new residents or at least people who spend a significant amount of time in the state working even if they're non-residents. People who therefore would always be paying uh, income taxes under um, any requirements on mobile workforce type laws. Uh, the mobile workforce issue is largely around people who aren't moving to your state, but maybe spending a short period of time, they're vacationing, they are on a work trip, they're traveling through, and are subject to income tax filing and withholding requirements, even if they maybe don't even have a dollar that they actually have to pay to the state because of standard deductions or other provisions. Um, you know, so many of us, if we spend a single day in a state, check a work email, we theoretically have to file with the state. Not many people do. Not many states really want you to because you probably have no liability and that's paperwork they have to process at an expense. 
putting some reasonable thresholds in place is really good policy. It doesn't have a lot to do with attracting individuals for the long term. The sort of people you're going to attract for the long term are clearly going to be paying your individual income taxes. Um, and then how does employment in a state for um, individuals square with marketplace based sourcing for businesses? And I'm, I wanna make sure I understand this question. The person who asked it, if you want to follow up, if I'm not quite getting at what you are trying to uh, address, businesses have their income apportioned uh, to the different states, especially under uh, corporate income taxes, at least. Um, it's on the basis of sales, payroll, and property, or at least it can be a lot of states, it's only sales. And within sales, um, you have to determine where a sale takes place. For tangible property, that's easy. It's where it ends up, it's where it's used. For uh, services, we use often market-based sourcing where the enjoyment of the services, some states use cost of performance or income producing activity where it's performed. So we have all of these different approaches. A lot of states are doing market sourcing, um, but the employment of individuals, that's, that's the payroll side. That's where a person is working. And where this gets complex, let's say that some of your employees uh, during the pandemic have moved to another state. And maybe it's a state that, um, you know, doesn't matter what it's what it is in terms of its apportionment. The fact that you have people in that state creates nexus, and you might owe income taxes in that state now, corporate income taxes, and it's based on whatever the apportionment formula is. Maybe it's entirely sales based, and you have sales in that state and didn't previously have uh, you know any uh, any nexus with that state. Now you owe on that. But maybe the issue this question is getting at, and a question that we need to think about, and I think we discussed previously in our remote work panel, is. Um, what happens if your employees, you're a service-based business, so it's not a physical presence question to begin with, but normally all of the services are performed in your home state or in a handful of states, and now they're being performed in states across the country, and some of them are cost of performance rather than market-based. Well, now suddenly forget the marginal difference with having an employee in a different state, a significant proportion of your service income is now being generated in another state for tax purposes if their cost of performance. I don't think a lot of companies have even considered this yet. Some states haven't considered it as much as you might expect. Um, it has significant implications if your employees have moved during the pandemic to a state that uh, sources based on income producing activity rather than you know on, on, on a market basis. So a lot of complexity we are going to experience during the pandemic and in just a um, you know post uh, you know post pandemic more remote work flexible environment. Um, let's see. You mentioned rural broadband projects. What are some what are some of the different things rural and urban governments should focus on addressing with this federal aid money? It's not an easy question. I honestly think that unless the guidance is extremely expansive, states are going to struggle to figure out how to spend this money. Uh, that isn't to say there aren't a lot of legitimate things they can do with it. We have revenue losses. And I said it's about 11 billion in aggregate, but of course that's, you know, that's some states with revenue gains, some with losses. There are real losses, billions of dollars worth of losses that will be offset by this. Uh, but after that, you do quickly run out of projects. A lot of the CARES Act style stuff, states, couldn't spend it all and needed extensions. So it's unclear just how much more they're going to be able to do in that category. Those uh, say the grants to individuals and businesses or the direct relief or the pandemic responses, especially since a lot of the more direct pandemic responses are covered uh, more by more discrete appropriations. I mean, there's funding for uh, vaccine rollout. You don't need to use this, this 350 billion for that purpose. Um, so yeah, what, what do you do with it? I don't know. I think that rural broadband will be a big part of this uh, because a lot of states have projects that have long been you know, in the development stage that they haven't necessarily funded and it's available. Um, some states probably have longstanding you know, um, water uh, projects. And a lot of those are at the local level and the local governments have funding too. So local governments might use it for that purpose. You could imagine state governments trying to incentivize locals to do that by providing a match using their funding, you know, where you do a 30% or 50% match or whatever it may be. Uh, honestly, just to use the money to find a productive use for it because you want to avoid spending just for the sake of spending. Um, I mean, obviously there's some things you can do to boost the economy in the short term, but it makes more sense to take long-term projects and move them forward than to make work uh, essentially. But I think it is going to be difficult in some ways for states to figure out what in the world they're supposed to use all of this funding for. Hopefully we'll get some clarification on that in the near future. And then a question, um, have states changed the way they tax home offices? For instance, can you deduct the cost of maintaining a home office from your income for teleworkers during a pandemic? 
To the best of my knowledge, no, but I can't speak definitively for every state. Obviously, the federal government has moved away from this. Um, you know, you had much more latitude in the past, you know, pre-TCJA to be able to uh, claim certain home office expenses than you can now. And, uh, you yeah, know, so you should be aware of the limitations that exist. And a lot of states follow the federal guidelines on this. Uh, some went their own way. You know, some have their own complete income tax code with very little federal reliance. I'm not aware of any states that have expanded it during the pandemic. Um, it's, it's a possibility, though. Um, a lot of states are looking for ways to make remote work more attractive. We've even had states move forward on ideas to provide credits or general tax relief for people who move to their states. And uh, you can get a little too aggressive on that, perhaps. I think the better long-term play is to focus on being uh, just an attractive place to live and work in a more flexible remote work environment, um, you know, not go doing the targeted incentives. But you'll see relocation credits and things like that. And they may include some money that is sort of geared around setting up your home office. but. I'm not currently aware that I wouldn't rule out the existence of uh, a change in the tax treatment of setting up a home office. I think that addresses the questions that we received during this session. So again, I want to thank everyone for joining us for six weeks of this uh, State Tax Policy Bootcamp. We really appreciate uh, you joining us for these. Uh, we'd love if you'd reach out to us if we can be of any assistance to you. Uh, we work with state legislators and state policymakers across the country. Um, you know, we we you know, provide legislative testimony. We write and research on a lot of these issues. We're available to ask questions, to answer questions. So you know, you have a link on your screen to all of the boot camp sessions. We hope that continues to be useful to you. Uh, we do have a newsletter if you want to receive general information about our research and resources. We hope you'll subscribe. I have our. Uh, you know, my contact information and our uh, you know, organizational Twitter account up there, uh, Just Tax Foundation. We hope you'll follow us. We hope that you know, you'll reach out if we can be of assistance to you or answer any questions that we haven't answered during these sessions. I know that uh, those who have watched you know, after the fact have sometimes reached out and emailed questions. Any of you who have further questions after this, you know how to find us. Uh, we hope that we can be helpful to you. We hope these sessions have been a useful resource to all of you, and we're grateful to everyone who's participated in them across these six weeks. So thank you once again on behalf of all of my team. Uh, we really appreciate it, and we hope you all have a great 2021.